singularity. We are very fortunate today to be visiting Greg Bear together with Ramez Naam and William Hurtling. So we get a very wide representation of uh, three fantastic science fiction writers, one with probably 40 books and uh, the youngest one with about three of them and Ramez with something like uh, six or seven, Ramez? Four. So four. Okay, yeah, but we're looking into the future. We're all about the future, so we will definitely <laughs> go right. through six or seven. And uh, we are going to talk about a few topics that I would do my best to put to make sure that there is a disagreement upon between these three uh, amazing science fiction writers. So let's begin with something less controversial, uh, such as what is science fiction and what's the purpose of it? You all three are engaged in that. You're all science fiction writers. So what is science fiction? That's a big question. I, I think you can do a wide variety of things with science fiction. I'm not sure it's that restrictive, but we might all choose to do different things. I like, as we were discussing earlier, to write about the present. I'm in sort of that Cory Doctorow camp. I love to write about real science, but my books are definitely about civil liberties, the war on drugs, the war on terror, real issues through the lens of the future. I do that too, but science fiction covers a multitude of sins. So you can scale it, you can ramp it up, you can do whatever you want for several years, and then you can go off and do something else. I think that's what we all do. I think some of my favorite writers like Fred Pohl or Arthur C. Clarke are going to write contemporary books like uh, um, Deep Range or... Uh, Fred Pohl's uh, Space Merchants, which is almost contemporary. And then they're going to go off and do the far future stuff, too. So we can do it all. And I feel like, for me, it's about examining possibility. Whether that's possibility in the near term or in the future, um, that's what science fiction, more than anything else, brings out for me, is thought-provoking uh, for the reader and what could happen and how does that affect people, ultimately. Speaking about talk thought-provoking for the reader. Let us talk a little bit about the technological singularity and whether it could or whether it would happen. So, Will, why don't you tell us why in the subtitle of one of your novels you say that the singularity is nearer than you can imagine? Because uh, the singularity, if you believe in um, the evolution of computing power, the accelerating uh, technology, then the singularity seems an inevitable outcome of that. That it's not necessarily about solving specific software problems, that that's not the fundamental barrier. It's about getting to hardware that's capable of doing what we can do. And once that happens, then the singularity is going to occur. And we don't know whether that, where that will come from, but it will happen as we get closer to hardware that's capable of it. We're not there today, so it's very hard to imagine. Ramez, let me pass that ball to you. An inevitable outcome? What do you want to say about that? We have to define what we even mean by the singularity. Do we mean the emergence of uh, human-level artificial intelligence? Well, there's nothing that says that we can't do that. Eventually, we probably will do that. Is that really an event horizon beyond which we can't see? Is that really a divide by zero event? I don't think so. Will a uh, greater than human intelligence automatically be able to make a smarter than itself intelligence even faster and then that one make us smarter and smarter and smarter? I don't think so. It'll take tens of thousands of human beings working for years to make an AI that is a little bit smarter than a human being and that one will just be part of a process involving lots and lots of people and researchers and hardware to make incremental process towards improvement. So I think a lot of these problems are sort of self-limiting or the problems get harder and harder as we go. I think uh, Ray Kurzweil and Werner Vinge are also kind of fond of using the inevitable adjective there. Werner qualifies it by saying, uh, falling short of any major disaster, like nuclear war, that's the most likely, almost inevitable outcome. I have a, a ton of respect for Werner Vinge and for Ray Kurzweil. They're both incredibly intelligent men. Uh, but an exponential trend does not guarantee a future exponential forever, is one issue. Uh, two, the difficulties of many problems are wildly underestimated. The difficulties of AI have been wildly underestimated for decades. 
The difficulties of simulating a human brain are currently wildly underestimated. Three, again, that, that self-improvement curve is not going to be there. An n plus one intelligence, an intelligence that is twice as smart as a human, is not going to be able to make an intelligence that is three times as smart as a human, because it will have taken tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to make that first intelligence. All of Intel Corporation, with tens of thousands of employees, haven't yet made a, a super intelligent AI. Right? So that's the sort of scale we're talking about. So Greg, we have two points of view. Inevitable outcome, greatly overestimating the, the problems in order to get there. Can you tell us the truth? I, I have two issues here. One of which is I kind of agree with, with you that the singularity is, in a sense, if not already here, it's a lot of people don't understand their world. And they don't have any control over it. So for many people, the singularity is already here. It's always been true throughout history, in human history. Uh, you, are, you are limited by what you can do, and in a society you're not able to do everything. So you are limited. You don't understand some people, flint nappers. Who can understand flint nappers? I mean, they're just so weird. They speak a different language. They don't talk to me the way, you know, sometimes they can't get dates. Who knows? You know, we don't know what we're going to do. Let's keep the flint nappers going in this world. Come forward a few thousand years, and those agriculturalists, I want to be a hunter-gatherer. Singularity is, those guys grow in grain. I don't want to go there. I don't, I don't even like bread. Meat, for me. Singularity today is computer programmers. How are we going to keep them under control? Because I'm sure they're going to do something wrong. Yeah. I mean, look, look at the rollout for, for Obamacare. That's <laughs> computer programmers. That's the singularity. <laughs> and My liberals. God. And liberals, right. <laughs> but, you know, we all need Obamacare, so maybe we can make it work. But we rely on programmers for that. We'll see. The whole notion of the singularity as a philosophical or word choice is bad for me, because you say divide by zero. It also refers to what happens when none of the equations work, because mm -hmm. you haven't figured out the theory for what's going on here. Everything hits the guidelines. But what's the limit of the singularity? Is it an, if it's an asymptotic approach, there's a limit for it. Is it one? Is it zero? You know, what's, what's the whole mathematical analysis of the singularity here? When you, what's singularity's name when it's at home? We've got all these fancy things that help us create kind of scare things. Singularity is going to be bad for you, so therefore you should read my book. You know, singularity is going to replace your children with, I don't know, <laughs> cats and dogs living together. You should read my book. <laughs> uh, I've written a really good science fiction book that the singularity is not as bad as it thinks it's going to be, so you should read my book. <laughs> There's a lot of self-promotion going on here and the whole concept of the singularity. And by the way, I can get grant money for it which is a science fiction concept. You know, writing up a grant proposal is writing a science fiction novel. Singularities, what do we mean by that? I'd say the point at which you are no longer in control of your life hits us every single day. At some point or another, we are no longer in control. So metaphorically speaking, the singularity is already with us. It has been with us since the beginning of time. And maybe machines will make it easier on us. If you have a machine that not only explains the singularity to you, but, but acts as your insurance against it, helps you guide you through it, that's what happens now when we have, you know, maps helping us. What if you have a philosophical map or a technological map? No, you don't want to make this decision because there's an AI down there that doesn't like you. Don't do that. So you have people half as smart as you or machines half as smart as you helping you avoid machines twice as smart as you. Mm -hmm. You have expert systems which say, I don't feel so good about that because my fuzzy stochastic logic says that's going to be bad for you. So you have assistants, you have navigators, you have all sorts of things going on, which we have now. They're yeah. called doctors, they're called teachers, they're called wives, they're called you know, editors. They keep us from our own harming ourselves. So is that a singularity? Absolutely. All writers experience a singularity when they realize, wait a minute, I don't understand my book. I've written this book. It's 500 pages long, and I don't know what I just did. Please tell me, you know? So an expert comes along and says, eh, it may be a bestseller. I like that. <laughs> I'll go with that. And by the way, buy my book. Mm -hmm. So it's self-promotion, it's language, it's scary language, it's Frankenstein, it's Frankenfood, it's singularities, it's robots taking over the world, and that's always cool. I love that. That's a great idea. What the hell do we mean by it? Well, let me give that opportunity to somebody who wrote the AI apocalypse. What the hell do you mean by the AI apocalypse and how likely of a scenario is that, Will? You know, for me, the AI apocalypse was about the scarcity of resources in 
the AI wanted computing resources and the humans needed them without having the ability to use computers to you know, run global supply chains, we weren't going to get fed, and we weren't going to get electricity, and we weren't going to get these things. And so there's a conflict that comes out of competing for this computing resource. Which is a cool idea. So, it's um, a cool, classic idea. Right? It is a cool, classic idea, though in, in the modern world, the way that usually that gets solved is the AI would sell its services and acquire funds to use to buy more computing resources, which if, is less if dramatic. If a libertarian persuasion. Well, if, it turns out that that's usually the way to, to acquire resources without getting shut down by a violence by your peers. Um, it makes for it's a less dramatic services, novel. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, that, that but what if you have a naive AI that does, in fact, really hunger for the ability to solve all the problems that's on its docket right now and can't do it because of human error? And it decides it can reach out and suck up resources yeah. that it's not allocated. One of the characteristics of the modern day is that no one human can understand them all. And this could be a differentiating factor mm -hmm. for AI in the future, that it would be possible for one AI to embody all the means of human knowledge and from that synthesize things that are beyond the capability of 10,000 Intel employees to synthesize. It's true. This, takes me, me back, it, it, this takes me back to a, 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 an actual postcard that was sent by a fan in the 1940s to another fan, which says, I have acquired a cosmic mind. What do I do next? <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, that's the ending of 2001, A Space Odyssey. Basically. So I don't know if Arthur is yeah. referring back to that particular question, or you have the star child, what's next? And no sequel is possible. And that defines the Clarkian singularity, is hmm. there, you are not going to be able to make the decision for that individual. Can you make the decision for yourself that makes sense? Let me jump in to sort of defend the underdog here and, and sort of address your point uh, with respect of why perhaps a, a trading exchange may not be as likely. Uh, imagine, say, the period of colonization, right? You have one site which basically has all the guns, steel, and, and etc. And the other side is uh, very unequal, unequal in, in, in order to engage in, in any proper trade especially since uh, the stronger side can step in at any point and by force acquire any resource or access to it uh, as they feel free and inclined to do it. And therefore, what is the incentive for them to really get into peaceful trade rather than simply go and acquire it as historically we know it happened very many times during colonization? Yeah, well, you're describing a very interesting scenario, but you've got the sides reversed because the side with all the guns right now is humanity and not the AI. Uh, the first AI that we invent will sit in a laboratory somewhere with a power plug that any human can can unplug. Uh, there's also this. That's not scary. <laughs> Wait, so well, it's scary terrifying for the AI. Yeah, so we, we can unplug AI. Stuxnet. Uh, we can't even keep it from getting onto the space station. Stuxnet is so far below anything that we might consider an, an AI. Exactly. But, but that's my point. It's like, because it is so far below it, how much more aggressive would potentially something be but that had more capability? What is motivation? It doesn't have one. It doesn't exactly. have one. Well, it does. It, ha it has a motivation to spread. Viruses have a motivation to spread, and that's it. But they also have users, so some people put things on Stuxnet that they carry into a system, and that happens with viruses too. So when you have a delivery system that is that good, it's part of the evolution of the reaction to the system. And that's the way it's always been. I think viruses are a much more, very sophisticated viruses are a much more realistic view of the future of the net than rogue AIs, I think. Things that are actually quite dumb uh, compared to any human intelligence, but extremely sophisticated at spreading, maybe out of our control, uh, very good at carrying payloads, maybe repurposed by humans to carry payloads that they want to have carried to their enemies, but not like self-aware... Uh, human-level intelligences or anything like that. Then we, we get to a... Yeah, uh, that's a good question. That's my good question here is most of us do not really understand what it means to be self-aware because it's a social interface. And that's okay. pretty solidly demonstrated in my thinking about this is you upload your self-awareness when you are interacting with other people. When you are alone, you lose yourself in your work. Quite literally, your self goes away or fades if you are not directly involved in interfacing with others. 
If you're a user in a social situation, then you are going to have usefulness out of a self-modeling system that creates a, how will they react to me if I do this, which is that circular reasoning that leads to self-awareness. So you have a model of yourself. If you're not in a social situation, if you're Robinson Crusoe on an island or a bear picking berries in the woods, you don't have self-awareness at that moment. You may acquire it later. I think that's, I would go a little bit beyond that because I think in isolation, you do have self-awareness in a certain sense, which is intelligent organisms, and I include a bear in this, have body awareness. They understand that this paw the is mine, yes. this rock is not, and they understand aversion to, I should move this body away when there is fire or a loud noise. Right. And that's what se part of what separates a bear from a rock to a certain extent, or a bear from a car, an automobile as of so far, until a few years from now, does not automatically avoid uh, danger. It has no sense that it's it should do so but in any way. does the bear tell itself, I should move away, or does it say, move away? It doesn't matter. A human moves away before saying, I should uh, move away, so actually. Bear. And the human, the human voice of, I should move away, we have lots of data to show, is an epiphenomenon that follows. Yeah, it follows the action. It's a story right. you tell yourself after you've done the action. So the self-awareness is an illusion imposed upon the brain after the fact to explain what we already did. Much of it, yep. yeah. And there is some feedback loop of that back so into... So if you have an artificial right. intelligence, how much of the artificial intelligence is its own self-supporting illusion? Yeah. In which case is that a vulnerability? Well, there's another question of why would we put R&D effort into developing that sort of self-awareness? Mm -hmm. There's lots of reasons, practical and economic reasons, to make better search engines, to make better cars, to make better dishwashers. Well, to make better, better, better soldiers, for example. A self-aware soldier would be a better soldier. When he gets wounded, he can self-repair and get, get back in action. Yes, you can imagine various reasons for that. Then there's levels beyond simple awareness of its body and so on. And there's levels like being able to adjust its motivations. And the more you go down this, you start to see things that you have to do that probably take specialized work, that don't just emerge, very likely, don't just emerge from the rest of the work that you're doing, and that bring up lots of ethical questions that are probably going to give pause as you're doing your research at every step of the way. So I, I see plenty of energy that will funnel down making smarter gadgets and doodads, smarter toasters, drones smarter search engines. Drones. drones are extremely dumb. Drones are, so, drones are dumber than Google, by far. Let, let me ask this. So you're talking about R&D dollars. Yes. But as the cost of hardware goes down, the hobbyist community can afford to engage more and more in AI. So Watson was created in IBM's lab on two and a half million dollars in hardware. And in the early 2020s, that same amount of hardware will be available to the common hobbyist in their home. Won't we see advances in AI coming from hobbyists and won't they have a different motivation in what they develop? Yes. They'd rather develop a friend or someone to talk to or an aide. Or I a think, date. Or a date. I think it's interesting to look at what the staffing cost was for Watson as well. What was the cost of the researchers doing the work yeah. is potentially much higher than yeah, I, uh, For the record, I interviewed David Perucci, who was the, the team leader of, of Watson, and they refused to release the numbers, but I've heard estimates ranging from 50 to $150 million, putting aside the hardware in terms of right. R&D. So we're talking still substantial <clears> costs, but, but going beyond the, 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 the computational costs, which are dropping exponentially, let me give you an, uh, an example, Mez. And we're talking about uh, evolution and emergence. I mean, in some sense, you can argue humanity or Homo sapiens emerged, and we don't really have a very good explanation why and how at a particular point in evolution it, it sort of happened, uh, specifically at that point. And why, you know, it's not a gradual process that, that happens gradually, but we have those bursts in evolution. And I don't think we have very good biological explanation, perhaps, and Greg could probably jump in here. But I would like to suggest we have the presence of armed drones and the presence of viruses like Stuxnet. What if we get some kind of weird combination in which a Stuxnet virus gets onto the drone network and starts spreading and taking over the drones? I've already made a movie about that and eventually becoming self-aware in a sort of network intelligence, if you will. And they are armed, and they are capable. 
it's really, really fun to think about these things of like things evolving intelligence, or as we talked about earlier, the whole net evolving intelligence. But let's be clear that humanity evolved intelligence over several million generations of evolution in the mammalian branch. In each generation, there were on average probably millions of individuals. Sometimes there were choke points down to thousands. Those individuals in the, the recent primate evolution had billions of neurons in their brain, trillions of synapses. Those brains were more complex to simulate than the largest supercomputers on Earth, meaning that they were billions of times more expensive than the computing power in those drones. So the idea that Stuxnet on drones could suddenly, without several million years of drones battling each other and dying and having sex and having drone babies, evolve intelligence is not science fiction, it's fantasy. This is not a reflection of how intelligence evolves at all. Okay, so let's... Let's assume that Ray Kurzweil is right, and in 2045, we have roughly the computational power to simulate one brain. Now let's go out 50 years, and we've gone uh, many orders of magnitude, more computational power. Why not run simulations of AI software at an accelerated pace so that maybe in 50 years I have run millions of generations of millions of individuals um, at very fast speeds. So, so at 50 years, you would have approximately uh, a billion times the computing power of one human brain if Kurzweil is right. I think Kurzweil is computing wrong. Computing or thinking power? Computing. So I think Kurzweil is wrong. I think Kurzweil is wrong, and 50 years after 2045, you might have the computing power, I suspect, of about one brain. But let's say Kurzweil is right. And you get to that point, and you have about one uh, billion brains worth of power. If you try to use an evolutionary process to drive evolution that way, you are still going to take a very, very, very long time. Because to get to where we were, you had, again, millions of generations of experimentation. And those generations had millions of beings living over decades and battling, like being tested over decades of life, and the ones that succeeded having sex and spawning new ones. Let me stop you right there. Why do you need that timeline? I mean, the, the dinosaurs ruled the earth for hundreds of millions, and then a niche organism, which were mammals, took over in a very short period of time. So actually over 10 or 20 million years. It's a very long scenario. I was just going back to the, the mammalian. I didn't go back to the dinosaurs. I just started with the mammals, the actually. Guy. <laughs> That's first mental second. We're going to get back there eventually. All the computational power of the human brain. You know, we've got computers now that are better than the human brains for computing things. Yeah. Thinking is not computing. We tend, to, again, to conflate these two things. Computation involves mathematical processes and, and basically uh, 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 algorithms that can solve mathematical number-based problems. Thinking is, how do I get a mate? Which cannot be put through a computer to get a good answer, despite uh, you know, shocking answer we can get on the advertisements on the web. <laughs> a weird solution to finding a mate. You know, I click on that, not going to help me. Computation and thinking have been confused by nerds for a very long time because we're upper brain thinkers. We think that most of what we do in rational thought is what's important. As you pointed out, your body doesn't agree. Your body does most of what it does and it tells you about it later. And that's kind of disconcerting for a nerd to realize you're not in control. And for someone like Sherlock Holmes, it's very disconcerting. And you end up taking drugs to overcome this fact, or a house, or whatever. So we have the stress between the upper brain thinker and the instinctive thinker. The body works on instinct. Doesn't mean it's been programmed to do and solve every problem. It means it cannot find all the right information to make a decision. If you are a deductive thinker, you need that information to make the right decision. Otherwise, it's garbage in, garbage out. Humans work with garbage in, life out. So when you've got a machine that is a user, that has motivations, and that is 99% not doing mathematical calculations to get its work done, you've got something interesting. We don't have anything like that. So, so let me ask you then, whether, we're, whether people like Vinji and Kurzweil are right or wrong on the singularity, there is another dimension to the whole idea, and that's sort of the religiosity of it, right? It's been called Rapture of the Nerds, it's been called Religion of the I like the games. title, yeah. It's been called uh, The Church of Robotics. All right. Well, 
tell me as a sort of singularitarian, how do you respond <laughs> to the criticisms against the singularity as a new religion for geeks? You know, I, I would not classify it as a religion for geeks. Uh, it's a possibility that's out there. It's not changing today how I live my life. I'm not basing it on the some faith in an ever or after that's based upon, you know, uploading my brain. If anything, I'm more concerned in the short term about the risks that don't require things like consciousness. That could be risks from trading bots going awry and crashing the global economy or drones killing indiscriminately. So in the, I, I can't really see the point of view of it as being a religion. It has aspects of a religion as a promotional thing. You're basically providing comfort for nerds. You know, what I do is so important that it could change your life. Please pay attention to me. We all do that. Writers do that. Computer programmers do that. We like the justification of feeling powerful, of being important. And so, to some extent, if a priesthood of computer programmers sets up and says, we're important, pay attention to us, that's a moment for them. It's not necessarily a moment that everyone else believes in, because we already knew that. Yeah. You know, they can screw our lives up. We know that because uh, we can get bad mail, you know, with, with bad programming errors and stuff. Bills can be sent to us that we don't have to pay. And it takes us six months of lawyers to get around it. So already they can control our lives. But it's not them. It's not the singularity people who are actually in control. It's actuarials. It's the lower level programmers. It's the guys in Tron who end up in the jail saying, hey, I'm an actuarial program. <laughs> I'm, I'm more powerful than, than Tron up there, you know. Because I do the stuff that gets you into real trouble. So I don't know. What do you think? I think there's a few people out there, not a majority, but there's a few who take it almost to a religious extent. I've heard people say to me, don't worry about climate change. Don't worry about world hunger. Uh, the singularity will solve that. Uh, you know, poverty, disease, the singularity will solve That's that. That's mystical. And that is mystical. And That's that, rapture. That rubs me the wrong way continually. But that's a very small minority. I think I mostly I'm happy that the conversation gets people thinking about accelerating change, about what's going to happen with advances in all these technology and robotics, biotech, nanotech, etc. That's good stuff. And I would just say, uh, in general, one thing that I'm more than aware of than ever as sort of a futurist is we should have a lot more humility about our forecasting of the future and recognize what we are seeing is a wide variety of possibilities and that there's a whole lot of things that could happen. And instead of saying, this is what's going to happen, say, here are a variety of possibilities, let's look at what actions we should take to maximize positive outcomes and even to guard against a wide spectrum of negatives and maximize positives. There, there is this aspect of, of setting a date. The world will change forever on this date. <laughs> Buy my book before this date, please. But, but and I, that's religious. That's religious, uh, what do you call it, hum, humbuggery. It's, yeah. it's basically, you know, the, the whole notion of I have been given a revelation. I can prove it rationally. Well, Cory Doctorow called it reverse apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and I don't believe in putting a date down because, A, no one knows the number of the AI beast. And no one knows when it comes, if we may quote here. And that's part of why I don't like the word singularity, because it is eschatological. It is end of the world. It is rapture-like. And even Time Magazine in their coverage, Lev Grossman, who I love, he's a great fantasy writer, he's a great book critic, his cover article for Time, he, often authors don't write the headlines, so it might not be his fault, his cover article for Time about Ray Kurzweil was 2045, the year humanity becomes immortal or something. And I'm like, oh, please, like this is not the right way to cover this topic. Or God but is dead. It probably sold a lot of magazines. Or the elephant in the room. I mean, time has been... It probably sold a lot of magazines, yeah. yeah. And time has announced the end of cancer, I, I think, a dozen times. So what can you say? Well, well, guys, as a geek myself, I can only say that for me today, the experience of interviewing the three of you separately and then all three of you together was an absolute rapture for a nerd <laughs> <laughs> and, and of biblical proportions. And I want to thank you for that immensely. And it would take some time for me and I hope my audience to digest the variety and the depth of the ideas that we managed to cover today. And I want to thank you very much. It's been fun. It's been thank fun. you. Hey, yeah, guys. very thank fun. You. Thanks for hosting Here's us here, Greg. Greg. Good to see yeah. you both. Good to see you. Work with you later. Yeah. Thank you very much, Greg, for calling us. All right. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Will. Oh, wait,